me get you right in the Word. Amen. And the Word is so real right now. It's just uh, the Word's alive in our church, if I can even uh, make that statement uh, without sounding cliche. Sounding cliche. It, it is alive. The, 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 the Word came alive and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. And uh, I want to continue along the lines that we've been discussing. We had uh, a, a word here Sunday. How many of you were here Sunday? Ay, 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 ay. I, I'm glad I was here. I'm glad I was here just because I wouldn't have wanted to miss it. Uh, Ashley and Jerry that were sitting over here uh, told me after service, wow, that's what Rock Church used to be like because they go back a long time. And so uh, I just felt something alive in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we heard those great words that came through the convention on the Friday through the Sunday night. And uh, God is shaping us. Uh, he's developing us into uh, a purpose that he wants for us. He's doing that because he loves us and because he has his plans uh, are, are for us to do us good and not harm. And what God has said prophetically over all of these years, 35 plus going forward, we are now like the tree where the root has come up out of the ground and the tree is beginning to grow and take on branches and take on its uh, divine uh, structure, superstructure I called it Sunday. And I believe that's what we're looking at. We're looking at God is building this church as a superstructure. And it's not so much the building stuff. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God is building his body. He's building us. And we're not laying again the foundations uh, uh, of, of God that we've grown to uh, appreciate, not uh, uh, ignore. We thank God for good foundation. This building has a good foundation. But what we're looking at is, how do we build on what we've already established as the foundational principles, and there's been structure added. Now, how do we build on uh, to what God wants to do? Paul even said it about the early church. He said, you know, some water, some plant, and God's called us to build now and build on to what he wants uh, from this body, from this church. And I'm excited for each of you. I believe it's your best season. I believe it's your best time, your best year. It's your best purpose that God has orchestrated for you is this season right now. This is the best time in God that you've had. And it's going to get better, but right now it's the best time. And if you'll embrace that and you'll believe that with faith, I, I believe simply that those things that you have pondered on and wondered about and wanted and prayed over and dreamed of those things are now are attainable by the faith of God and by the power of God's plan the things that you have in your heart are obtainable apprehend the thing you've been apprehended for in this season so I believe God is saying some good things to us now we talked about Sunday uh, and that I would come over here. We talked about Thursday night before convention. We started talking about the fact that, that uh, God is doing some powerful things within us. And uh, he's, he's building us. He's building us as a church. He's building us strong as a church. But he's building us personally. And we must remember what the scripture says. That we shall be able to stand before kings. Proverbs tells us we shall be able to stand before kings. Now, there's so much to that. I'm taking us past that, but I don't want to leave it without reminding us the importance uh, of the process of God taking us through these steps that we stand uh, before kings. Now, you stood before kings. You stood before King David. You better have your act together. You stood before Pharaoh as Joseph did. You have to have your act together. When you stand before a king, you can't be there uh, in just kind of casual, half-baked kind of place. You've got to realize that you're standing before kings, God said. Now look, look at this. God said you're going to stand before kings. How about the king of kings? 
<laughs> yeah, right. How about the king of kings? You're going to stand before the king of kings. And I mean, you know, that's going to be an awe moment of, 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 of a scope unimaginable. But you get to stand before kings. I have stood in the presence of presidents. There is an aura. There is a, a mantle. There is a sense of awe that comes when you stand in the presence of somebody who holds that kind of authority over a nation. When I was in the home of the president of Nigeria and I stood before him and I sat at his table and ate, uh, it was not like anything I had ever known. It was an atmosphere. It was an atmosphere that I could not conjure in my mind. I could not uh, dream up. It was an atmosphere of, of a, a, imagination not even possible to a person in my position from my past. But I stood there as a new creature in Christ Jesus and realized that God was exposing me to another level of purpose in God, another level of authority, another level of, of prestige uh, and of thinking uh, bigger than I had thought before. And so tonight, uh, we're going we're gonna to stand uh, before kings. We're going to stand before kings, Proverbs says. And, uh, and we get to really feel the impact. When you stand in front of somebody that has an anointing, Sunday morning, you were standing on the stage, some of you, and you can uh, attest to the fact, I've heard others say, what an anointing was up on that stage. And it's because at that moment, uh, there was a transference uh, from transpreneuration going to take place. And God uh, came in with his holy angels and God set the atmosphere. God brought the atmosphere with the angels stirring uh, and his glory present so that there could be a divine impartation. Amen. I believe something powerful is going on in the heaven realm over this church. I believe the conversation of God is activated tonight. Uh, that God is talking about this little church uh, for its destiny has to do with God's plans that he's doing in Madagascar, <clears throat> that he's doing in other nations. God uh, has orchestrated this hour, this day, this time for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now... Sunday I talked about the, the, the need for transmenumeration and you had to take on uh, uh, the, the spirit of another man. And uh, Paul uh, uh, has the same story. David took the same story and there was a transference with David that he gave that to uh, uh, those around him and under him and uh, uh, Jonathan and, and his own son Solomon. And we know the story of Moses and we know the story of, of uh, uh, Joshua, how that transference. We know that there's times when there's, a, 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 of course, we, we talked about a lot about uh, Abraham and the transference there, uh, and Moses was the piece that I pulled out Sunday, and we looked at it and saw that Moses took the 70 elders, and he, God said, I'm coming down in the cloud, and when I come down, I'm going to take the spirit that I put on to Moses, and I'm going to put it on those 70. And there was an actual transference, transpernumeration. That word, uh, uh, penuma, is the trans, means to move it, and panuma means uh, spirit, uh, and migration means to another location. And so that never, another location is to another body as we talk about laying on of hands. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, we talked about it being the theme of this little mini-series we're dealing here with. But I don't believe it's a mini-series so much as it's a real prophetic current word for us to grab a hold of so that we can step in to our divine destinies together and individually to accomplish the will of God on the earth. Amen. Amen. And I, I believe no, with no doubt that we saw uh, something transferring supernaturally uh, and something happened uh, 
uh, here on, on Sunday that we will look back at and say there was a stone set in the, uh, like I gave the story about Jacob. Uh, he set a stone up when he rose up out of that sleep and he said, I did not realize I was in the house of God when I awoken and the portal of heaven was open and God's glory was coming down out of that. The ladder was dropped. The angels were coming and going and God was standing there. And he said, man, oh man, the house of God is where the portal of heaven is at. If we learn that, we will never be the same and we'll never see the church the same. If we realize that God lets these institutions of these structures called buildings, called churches, be established so that God would have a holy environment to allow a glory Shekinah of God to drop down and open a portal where the miracles and the power and the word of God can freely come in and access. Woo! My God, that's a heavy thought. Let me take you over here a minute and show you something. Uh, I, I, I just want you to see this in, in this illustration. And, and if this represents a, a, a tent of sort, of, and, uh, and we could just get a picture that this is some kind of tent that's uh, er uh, erected. And, and in that tent is where the glory of God comes. And we're looking at a tent there. And so the, the, there's a glory of God and there's an opening there. There's the door the, and, and there's this tent now. And in this tent is where the glory of God is. And so if we could just see that together, and, and get a picture of that. We could really get an idea of this awesomeness of this tent. But what I want you to see is this. This is what I want you to see. Is the Shekinah. Let's, let's just draw a little cloud up here. And put this cloud. And let's believe that the Shekinah of God is dropping down out of the heavens. Uh, and it's coming down into this uh, uh, tent uh, and that's the glory of God coming uh, not rain but the glory of God and so when God uh, comes over that tent this is a tent there's an opening there's a portal of heaven that's a hole and it's been opened uh, it's been opened so that God uh, can cause uh, his glory to come out of the earthly realm and come into the realm of man and God can visit us in a way we've never known before. That's how come the church is so important. That's how come the church is so vital. If we just could understand, the portal gets opened, the building gets built because God always has a place before he has a people. He has a land, he has a place, and then he has a people. And then when God has a place and he has a people, then he has a purpose. And when God has a people and a purpose, a place of people and a purpose, then what God does, he lets the heavens open through the adoration of our praise, our worship, our love to him opens that portal wider and wider. When we come in here on Friday nights and we pray, oh my God, when we open up this house and we begin to pray Friday night in a couple of weeks, when we come in here and pray again like we've been praying, the portal of heaven gets wider and wider and wider and more of God's glory keeps coming in that portal. And God only says, if the worship team, if the intercessors, if the praying folks uh, would all come together and begin to pray, God said, I'll open the portal of heaven and I'll pour out my glory that you shall not be able to contain. Amen. Woo! Amen. My God. I'm excited. How about you? I'm excited about God opening this portal even wider. Your prayers are pushing it open. Your worship is pushing it open. So in that process... We saw, we talked about how that God uh, told uh, uh, Moses that he was going to take what was on him and put it on the people. We saw people come up on Sunday, and uh, we also understand that uh, uh, Elisha, Elisha, when Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, when he got that mantle from Elijah, uh, uh, he had a servant, and the servant's name is uh, uh, Gehazi, 
And we see that Gehazi, you know, just uh, didn't do too well. Gehazi did a wrong thing. And he went there to Naaman, followed him, and took that uh, which belonged to uh, Naaman, which was of this worldly, earthly mammon. And he, instead of the ministry of the anointing that God uh, put on him, he went and he was willing to take what the world have. How many people have traded the anointing for what the world has? We want something from the world and the world can't satisfy you. But if you get a hold of the anointing, it'll fulfill every need. How did Gehazi surrender what he was living with? He was close to the man of God, but, but he didn't have the spirit of the man of God. He had no transpreneuration. He had no impartation. You can be in this church and never get close to the vision, to the visionary, close to what God is doing so that you receive. And when the word comes, you open up. And when you have opportunity, you come and hands are laid on you. When that impartation takes place, you then will have the same mindset, the same passion that that person who laid hands on you has. And that's what Gehazi didn't, he didn't get it right. See, he didn't have, Elisha didn't have that mammon spirit on him. But uh, uh, Gehazi had another spirit. You know, the Bible says that um, there was another spirit on uh, Caleb uh, and, and, uh, and um, uh, when they went there to, uh, with the spies, you know, and uh, Joshua and Caleb, there was another spirit on Caleb. And he had the spirit of God on him. He had the same spirit that Joshua had on him. He had another spirit. Because the other spies, they didn't see the way Caleb and Joshua saw. How many of you know when you have the right spirit? I'm not talking tonight about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the triune trinity personality of the Godhead. You and I get filled and our inner man gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And he gives us an evidence with speaking in tongues. And that's what came on the day of Pentecost. They got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I got to tell you something. It also came uh, when they, they got touched. Uh, and that's when uh, Paul's eyes are blind. And it, God sends uh, this old prophet to him. And he lays hands on him. And the scales fall. As soon as the hands got laid on him, it transferred. This thing has been transferred to generation after generation. It's being passed down. It's powerful to think. That somebody could impart gifts to you. The Bible says that you can receive gifts. Uh, I could pray for you for the gift of healing to come on you. I can pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can come on you. I can pray and impart the gifts of God to you. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians, God gave gifts unto men. I'm a gift. We're a gift ministry, and we give gifts to other men. We lay hands on them, and they receive those gifts. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But you see, Gehazi didn't have that spirit on him. And I just tell you this, uh, I'd never be in the ministry. I'd never be in the things of God and doing what I'm doing today in God had I not got close enough to my pastor so that he touched me, so that I got a hold. You remember the woman, she got touched with that issue. Man, oh man, she touched him. She touched him, the hem of his garment. She touched the bottom of that thing. She got close enough to touch him. And I want you to know, a lot of people bump by Jesus, but they never touch him. You need to learn that there's a touch that comes from God and there's a touch that comes from man. And you need both of them in your life. I needed that. I needed to have Jesus touch me. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. And I needed a man to put that anointing on me so that I could fulfill the destiny that God had for me. And so in that light of that, I want to take you tonight to mentoring. Because when there's a transference uh, of anointing and transpreneuration, when there is a transference of anointing, uh, we understand there's a transference of sin offering. We talked about that Sunday. Please get the tape on Sunday if you haven't been able to, if you weren't here, uh, get the CD, whatever, download it off the internet. You can do all that and uh, do that so that you can keep up with what God is trying to speak to us. 
And, uh, and then as well as don't miss, uh, uh, we don't have uh, Thursday night uh, in a week because of Thanksgiving, but the following Thursday night, I have another part of this, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share it with you. And uh, I'm hoping I get uh, through this. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about uh, a breakdown of a passing uh, transpernumeration anointing, a double portion of anointing. Uh, you know, I said it Sunday. I'm going to say it again before I take you into this mentoring thing. When you desire a transference of anointing that someone else has gifting to you, remember, we're not supposed to be in discipleship and discipling and learning to be mentored. We're not after the soul that the man has. We're after the anointing, the spirit that's on the man. We need to learn the difference because when you desire uh, uh, the, the soul, you will get the flesh. You will get that. And, and a lot of people uh, get turned off by the, by the flesh of man, rightly so. Uh, but they get turned off and they don't step further to realize that it's not the soul they want, it's the spirit on the man they're after. Give you a good example. I gave it to you Sunday. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, Moses laid hands on 70 and they got his spirit, not his soul, not his suke. And, you know, really what they, they didn't want that. <laughs> If you remember, Moses was a bad dude. He killed the Egyptian. He thought that would give him some kind of favor, leg up. Uh, Moses uh, smoked the rock that was following him along. I mean, this guy was, you know, he was uh, a mental case. He was tough in the soulish realm. Look how many people operated in the soulish realm. And, and David, David had some soulish issues. I mean, who is Bathsheba? Not his wife. And uh, he, he sends a guy, Bathsheba's husband, out to battle. She know, he knows he's going to get killed. And, and, and God still uses him. Why? Because it was the anointing. It's the spirit of God that was on the man. Do you get the understanding? It's not the soul. I, I may have personality quirks. You, I do. Uh, uh, you may have personality. You do. Uh, we all may have personality quirks uh, that could uh, be what may hinder us if that's all we're looking for. But I do not look for uh, uh, the, the flesh. I mean, if you hear that, I'm not looking for the soul of the man. I'm looking for the anointing that's on the man. How do you hear that? Have you know the jackass that prophesied had an anointing to prophesy? I sure wouldn't want him to be mentored by a jackass, by his soul. Amen. You getting that? Yeah. Now, we need to get this tonight. We need to get a hold of this. Let's talk about it. Uh, the Holy Spirit in this hour uh, is trumpeting some clear things to us. Uh, and, and here's what he's saying. He's telling us to get ready, prepare. There's a great ingathering of souls that God wants to bring in here and in the church and in the global uh, economy of God's purposes. I believe that God wants us to receive a mantle of anointing of a soul winner. Now, I've said it before. How many of you have been here when I give an altar call at an eternity? Come on, put your hand up. Right, okay. I have an anointing. I have an anointing to win souls. I, I can witness and I can lead people to Christ. Uh, I give altar calls and people's hearts get stirred. That's the anointing on me. If you say, well, I, I'd like to win souls like that. I come, I can't win souls like that. Well, come here. Come on. I'll pray for you. How many of you know that that is how you get the gift of someone to transfer over to you. You want to be able to preach. You want to be able to prophesy. You need to know, get, I got a hold of Sister Kitely. I got around a prophet so that I could learn how to prophesy. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So here we are now. We're talking about mentoring. And so there's preparing this time for a great gathering uh, and the local church and leadership's being raised up and equipping members for the work of the service uh, for a great harvest of souls. That's what we saw Sunday. And uh, Numbers 10.9, Numbers 10.9, God is preparing us. Numbers 10.9, he is preparing us 
uh, for battle. When you enter into battle in your land against an adversary who attacks you, sound short blast, short blast on the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God and delivered from your enemies. Hallelujah. And on your joyous occasions, your appointed feast, at the beginning of each month, you are to blow the trumpets. That means you are to declare, you are to blow the trumpet of the prophetic utterance of God and say, Lord, I declare that the war has been opened up. The war has been set. How many of you know I said a month ago that this is going to be two years of war? We're going to know war like we've never known. But we're going to not know it just to get beat up. We're going to know it to win. We're going to know war on how to fight in the spirit realm, and we're going to know how to win the war. I don't want to lose the war. I want to win the war. Come on, come on. Now, and then the thing that God does and he's doing right now, he's preparing for the move of the Holy Spirit in a fresh new way. In Numbers 3, 6, you'll see that. Uh, and, and, and there's all kinds of heavenly warfare going on right now. And uh, I, I believe the church is entering a new phase, no doubt about it, marked by some of the greatest harvests that we've ever seen, harvest of souls characterized by the kingdom evangelism, kingdom evangelism, uh, with great, uh, with the goal of going beyond the walls of this ecclesiastical edifice here to infiltrate every strata of the secular world for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you say amen? Every place, the marketplace, every place, all the mountains, uh, every area, God is come to anoint us. Some of you are going to have influences in places of the medical industry and all kinds of secular industries, but you're going to come inside the house of God. You're going to get downloaded by the Shekinah that's coming, the portal of heaven that's open. You'll not neglect the house of God. You'll not neglect the sitting under the anointing. And then what's going to happen is you're going to go back into your fields. And when you do, you're going to see God use you. You're going to know you're there for a divine purpose, not just to make beans, not just to get some money. You're not there just to get a paycheck. Amen. You're there to have an influence for the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, a major ingredient missing uh, in all this that goes on is the missing ingredient uh, that's probably more important. Uh, it, it, it's it's Christ-centered leadership. Christ-centered leadership. That's what God's after right now. And uh, we have to begin to prepare ourselves uh, for all that God wants to do. do. You know, think about Jesus. Jesus spent three years uh, in, the, in, in his disciples, with his disciples, and planted uh, a little mustard seed of that ministry in them. And then the disciples, of course were no higher than the one that was mentoring them. That's what the scripture says. Uh, even, you know, we can think of preparing leaders for this next generation of the next decade with a great depth of information with little or no mentoring. That's not going to happen. We're not going to supersede and do something that Jesus didn't do. We ain't got no new thing just because we got uh, tablets and things that we can do uh, and we got computers and we got cell phones and we got all that going on. We're not going to supersede what Jesus did. He gave us the pattern and the pattern was to raise up disciples. You know, it was months ago, I remember saying to this church, I'm not going to call you Christians anymore. I'm going to call you disciples. How many of you remember saying that? Yes. Right. So disciples, how many of you say, Lord, I thank you. You're making us disciples, disciples of Christ. How many of you hear that? That's really what we are. And we're going to learn that. We're going to practice that. We're going to make sure that we walk in that. And we're going to be able to absorb uh, ourselves in that understanding. We're true disciples of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Discipleship or mentoring is the primary matrix for world evangelism, mentoring, uh, able, mentoring able men and women who will produce more able men and women until the earth is covered with the knowledge of the glory of God. That is what discipleship and mentoring is about. Mentoring involves uh, the leader known as the mentor pouring his life into his protégés, thus 
transferring, there it is, his spirit or, or committing his spirit to faithful men of the task of stewarding uh, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Saints, Jesus taught us. He did that with the disciples. And we need to understand, everywhere I turn in this church or any church, there's always this vacuum. And you find a leader, and then you find a, a few faithful, and then you find a gap. You find a big gap. And the big gap is that there's, there's, there's nobody discipling somebody else. So that's how the church can become extinct, because there's nobody investing in the next generation. That's why I've wrote a new book about generation four, three, two, and one, and how four and three need to turn their hearts towards two and one to bring up another generation that can, that can be discipled and mentored and, and, and can take on what the good things God has done and take it further. How I many of you know 35 years, we're just youngins, but 35 years is a history. I want to see these children uh, that I see running around here worshiping. I want to see them rise up, become grown, mature adults, and they carry the anointing that was transferred to them, but take it further, and it'll be because of discipleship mentoring process. Uh, those two words actually are synonymous. Those two words work together. Now, when Paul was first converted, as, as uh, Barnabas watched Paul preach, he saw potential in Paul. And after Paul was apparently rejected, look at Acts chapter 9. That's what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 9. It's turn there. If you're, if you're not, turn there. Put it on the board, Angela. Let's look at it together. Acts chapter 9. When Paul uh, was converted, Barnabas took him on. The Barnabas grabbed him and said, boy, there's something about this guy. He watched Paul preach. And Paul was apparently rejected by the apostles first, and Barnabas pursued Paul and, uh, and, and, and would see this. But Barnabas took him, Paul, and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas, this is after uh, Saul uh, gets changed over to Paul and he has that encounter with God and he comes out of that period of time of just being uh, processed by God uh, and his eyes are blind and the, and the, the old man comes in uh, and, and Ananias and he takes the scales off his eyes and uh, by the anointing of God he lays hands on him and then Paul became the preacher Paul. And, uh, and all of a sudden, man, the word was in him already because he was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a scholar. Paul had the knowledge of the, of the Old Testament in him. He knew that. And now he was having this encounter with Jesus. And the old was becoming new. And he had revelation. And Barnabas saw him and heard him preach in Damascus and said, Whoa, this guy has got it. He's anointed. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. This is Paul. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went away to slay him. But they went about, I'm sorry, went about to slay him. And uh, they, they were going to deal with him. And uh, look at Acts chapter 11. Uh, uh, later, uh, you know, they, they didn't like this. They didn't like what he was doing. They didn't like what he was doing. In uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 25, and uh, then uh, departed uh, Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. He went after Saul. And, uh, and when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Notice how they were called. The disciples were called Christians, not Christians called disciples. <laughs> How many of you hear that? Get it in the right order. And that's important to see because Jesus calls us disciples. The Christian name became an attachment that would give us an identity in a world setting. It would do some things, some harmful actually, 
but really who we truly are in the root of who we start off with is we're disciples, if you've been truly born again. How I many you know when we start you off as a Christian trying to make you a disciple, we have to work through the fact that you're small. Christ, that little Christian meant little Christ or a little rock, a little pebble off the rock. It means something tiny. And, and that's what the emperor uh, of Rome uh, first uh, came up with that term. And, and, and really it's a label on us that has in many cases hindered us. And it's made us small, insignificant, weak, and but God said, Jesus said, I call you my disciples. That means you are kind of my kind. You have been made in my image. Yeah. You have been touched by me. And because of it, you're carrying what I carry. And that's what makes us disciples. We then take on the name of a Christian to help the world be able to understand us better and understand who we are. But in the root of who we are, we are disciples of Christ. And that's what needs to come off of these altars. That's what needs to come out of our prayer rooms. That's what needs to come out of our discipleship plans and mentoring plans is we need to be raising up disciples. We need to raise up people. Disciple is Christ-like disciplined one that's what a disciple is disciple definition is christ-like or a disciplined one Amen. now how I mean, you know if we were to really measure that out there's a there's a gap there i mean you know it's easier for people to come in and say i'm a christian almost like belonging to a club i'm a christian i you know i just belong to the club I mean, you know, I can go to a golf club and say, I go to, uh, you know, uh, Country Western uh, uh, Golf Course. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of the golf course. I'm part of the club, the golf club. But I mean, you know, I may be the most horrible golfer you ever met. Because, because I belong to the club don't mean I'm a real golfer. Hey, come on. I mean, you know, we need to understand disciple means something different. Let, later, the phrase Barnabas and Paul, uh, the phrase Barnabas and Paul was changed to Paul and Barnabas. You see, these guys hung out together, but God did such a work that all of a sudden uh, the change came. I mean, change came and uh, indicated that part Barnabas saw the baton of leadership had been passed on to Paul. So Barnabas was the one that trained him, but the one he trained became greater. Have you ever heard that before? I thought it was Jesus that said to the disciples, greater things shall you do in yeah. my name. Yeah. How many you know Barnabas gave Paul an entrance, but God gave Paul a great anointing and it took him to great places. I think one of the greatest thing a parent ever realizes is, is when your, your child rises up and does something greater than you did and, and brings some kind of honor. You know you're the parent. You know you're the reason they're on the earth. You made them by procreation. You understand that. But there's something inbred in us that wants to see our child do better than we do. And that is the way it is in the kingdom. God the Father wants Jesus to do greater. Have you know that Elijah raised up Elisha and Elisha did twice the America, amount of miracles that Elijah did. That's why I'm going to talk to you about the double portion. The double portion is that twice uh, uh, of the anointing. That is so important today. And you and I as believers, listen some things God's let me do. Well, I want you to get more than I got. I want you to do more than I've done. I want my children. I love to see my children prosper. It's wonderful. My middle son, I watch him <laughs> prospering. And I tell him now all the time, shoot, man, I'm going to quit working and just let you pay for the bills. Uh, it's just, you know, fun. And uh, he's making serious money. 
And the kid is just doing great. But you see, I, and I go places and everybody's standing around there. Uh, Art Mardell's son, a grandson, was at his place the other night talking to him. Oh, man, big, you know, this is big money, man. And they're there talking about, can we do some things together? And my son's telling me that. And I go places and they, they say, oh, hey, Matt, hey, Matt. And my son, Matt, says, oh, yeah, and this is my dad. <laughs> I think I smack you. Hey, but you know, point being is, I'm just as proud. He's being elevated. And that's what God wants to do. God wants to teach us the power of mentoring and discipleship is taking someone else and mentoring them and bringing them up for it's part of the kingdom. It's part of the kingdom. It's part of the kingdom nature for you to take somebody and help them be elevated. That's what mentoring's all about. Can you hear me today? Tonight? Mm -hmm. Now look, it says here, uh, Barnabas, he knew that, that Paul was getting the mantle and, and it was being passed on him and greatness rested in, uh, in him and he was recognizing it and, and surpassing him in giftings and spiritual authority and submitting that the new phase of advancement was coming on the church because of it. Listen, I pray every day, every night that you are here and you that are young would rise up, take this church and make it this awesome place where God can move. Nothing greater, nothing greater sits in my heart than to know that could happen. Nothing. And, and let me give you some list, uh, just a few, just a, 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 a simple little list of some mentoring qualities. Uh, qualities of a mentor, I think, are important to know them so you can recognize, are you that? If you're not, you can achieve that. You can reach to that. How many of you know, every one of you right now, if you've been listening and what God is saying, there should be some things burning inside of you that you want to excel. You want to do well in every area of your life. You want to be able to do so that you can help somebody else do what God's called them to do. How many of you say, yep, yeah, that's me, Lord. I want to do better than I've ever done. And I'm going to help somebody else really do a good job Amen. in their life. Number one, there are... and. and you can identify them now. These are qualities you can identify. Uh, they're, uh, they are role models. How many of you know mentors? Mentors and disciples are all the same. They are role models. How many say, Lord, thank you? And uh, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you and to, uh, to follow us, 2 Thessalonians 3.9. 2 Thessalonians 3.9. I'll give you some scriptures with this. You can look at it. 2 Thessalonians 3.9. So here's the key now. Uh, it, it's that Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. We need to learn that there is a mentoring process that is so important. And it is based on... Am I a role model? You say, well, I don't want to be a role model. Look, saints, you already are. I don't care. You're either a good one or a bad one, but you are one. You don't get a choice on that. If you, if you live in life, you are a role model, a role model of what it means to be a jerk, <laughs> what it means to be a failure, or what it means to be a leader, a success, or an overcomer, an achiever. Either way, you are a role model to somebody. So I may be here. And if I, if I could say this, even as I'm in the middle of this book being produced, I, I, it's so important to me that Generation 3 should be reaching Generation 2 to be the role model so that they can see what it means to run after God. Generation 2 should be reaching back. Remember, your success is not in front of you, but it's behind you. Your future is not in front of you, but it's behind you. And that means that Generation 2, that's the 12 to 25-year-olds, are reaching back to help Generation 1 rise up and become great. I watched uh, uh, Friday, uh, Saturday, uh, last weekend. Uh, I, I watched, uh, was it last weekend? Yeah, I watched uh, the uh, children, uh, and, and they had the Harvest Festival, 
and somebody has sent me a picture of, of the children's band. They have a little children's band, young, younger kids' band. I'm talking to the little guys. And I saw them, they were out there cold, and they were holding the mics like this, and they were shaking, and they sounded like they were yodeling sometimes. <laughs> they sounded like they were yodeling. They were so cold, they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were trying to sing, but they were shivering. And the little drummer was there just beating away, and they had, uh, they did let Taryn, the old guy, get in there. He's now the old guy, see? He's the old man. God's finished with him already. No, not really, not really. But uh, what God is doing is he's letting us see that we can start that next generation to emulate the one in front of it so that we can see a mentoring process happen right in front of our eyes. Now, number uh, two, uh, First Thessalonians, uh, I'm sorry, First Timothy uh, 3, 4, and 5, uh, they are self-managed, self-managed, and managers of others. Oh, I wish I had the time. These people who are mentors are always self-managed and they're able to manage others. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection uh, with all gravity. For if a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Well, that's simple there. So you have to, first of all, to be uh, moving in this mentoring thing and, and being a disciple, you got to start mentoring your own self. You, you got to bring some discipline, some self-management skills. I, I'd like to spend uh, maybe a, a couple of Thursday nights on teaching people uh, what I believe is a, is a powerful uh, lesson to learn, and it can be applied in the spirit and in the natural, is to learn how to discipline your life uh, to be a planner, and, and to be a strategist and uh, to be somebody that plans with strategies and then how to execute, how to bring things into fruition, how to bring things into a point of accomplishment. And uh, I read a story one time, it said, do you want to start learning to manage your life? Manage that dirty drawer that's in your kitchen that's got everything under the sun in it. <laughs> or go to your closet and manage that floor of that closet. Or go to the trunk of your car, maybe the back seat, or maybe the front seat, and manage that. It don't matter, but you got to manage something, and you got to manage it so that you can manage others. And then that means you're on your way to learning how to be a real mentor. Managing uh, is in a key, key place. Self-managing, self-managing uh, yourself in the Word. Discipline yourself to study. I, I say it all the time. I'm so disheartened by the lack of, of young men and women that want to study God's Word. And, you know, I think they want to preach, but they have no desire to study the Word. Well, what are you going to preach? If you don't study the Word, what are you preaching? I mean, this thing is about the word. Number three, uh, Genesis 45, 8. 45, 8. They are fatherly. Mentors are fatherly. There's a father aspect. So now, uh, so now it was not you that sent me, Joseph, hither, but God, Joseph said. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh. And Lord of all of his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph was a young man that was fathering the Pharaoh. Now, you got to get this story. This is, I, I have a book about this. It's important to understand that Pharaoh, who was young, but Pharaoh had responsibility and had authority at that time beyond the known world there was hardly anyone like a pharaoh pharaoh is not the name of a person pharaoh is the title of a person like president and so the pharaoh of that time was a powerful powerful individual and it says that joseph became a father to him oh my lord and you see joseph had been fathered by his father jacob and Jacob had fathered Joseph, and Joseph now understood the quality that he had in him to father someone else. And look, it don't mean you're going to always have to father somebody. Uh, I father people that are older than me. Just ask Mel. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, you, you father people that are older than you. You father people that are more successful. I've, I've fathered people that, that are, are multiple millionaires and all of that. God isn't interested in that. That fathering anointing is not based on age. It's not based on your position. It is based on the call and anointing that God places on you. Yeah. And so that is one of the qualities of a true mentor. You have a fatherly aspect. You see things. Uh, you warn them of things. Uh, you caution them of things. You, you have that fatherly where you correct them when it's necessary. You love them when it's necessary. You have that fathering thing that won't give in to their little whimper, but you will stand uh, and sometimes even let them fall to the ground and skin their little knees and bump their little elbows because a father will stand uh, and be close by, but not interfere with the growth process. Boy, is that... I just said a lot right then. Number four, they are patient and tolerant of mistakes because they realize the time continuum involved in producing the mature leader. That's important now. The mentor is a person that's patient and tolerant in mistakes. I'm not a patient person <laughs> by a person who is deliberately being lazy are careless but I am a patient person when somebody makes a mistake and I have all these years I hear all this baloney that goes out and and it's so stupid because people that I've rehired that uh, you know had to leave and they had to leave the church uh, you know it's structure because they were messing up you know shacking up hanging out doing the wrong thing whatever it didn't matter and then they come back I am long suffering uh, I had to let a girl go one time she was a secretary because she was coming to church office drunk she was drinking at night and in the morning before she came to work I had to let her go well in that process I still hung on to her and paid her bills for months even though she wasn't working because I was hoping and was believing and was patient and tolerant for the mistake not at the expense of casting her out to the wolves I hope you understand that there's a big difference number um, five they are led uh, Romans 8 14 they are led by the spirit uh, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How important that is. They are led. Mentors are led by the Spirit. What you saw Sunday, when you saw me up here and I was preaching, and then I began to end the service and begin to call some things forward and move some things around, and then I got some people to come up, and then I had the group come up, and when I was doing that, that was not me having a plan. I had it nowhere written down. I didn't have it pre-decided uh, in my head. I didn't have it anywhere. I just was just uh, flowing <laughs> and being led by the Spirit. Amen. Saints, I got to tell you something. There's no greater thing that I could give you than to know discernment, having discernment of Spirit, and to also be led by the Spirit. That means you have to hear God. You have to hear God. And uh, some of you that got ministered to up there, uh, I said some things to different people. Uh, I said to uh, Adaku, I said to Adaku, uh, uh, I felt like I didn't tell her the total thing because I might have made her sick. But when I grabbed her hand, I looked down at my hand and it was though I had her liver in my hand. It was though her liver... And then I looked, and it was just her hand, so I kind of thought, well, maybe it's just because it's so soft and it's kind of frail and tiny. And I, I just looked at it, and it's like I was holding her liver. And as soon as I let go, I re-grabbed it again, and the Lord said, iron. Well, I understood there was iron in her liver. That meant she's tired, she's run down, and she doesn't have the energy. And my, I went to my wife afterwards, and my wife said, that's very common for women who have multiple births 
behind each other. They deplete the iron surplus that's in your liver. And they deplete it, and they need a re. They used to give uh, mothers. Uh, after they gave birth, they used to give them vitamin uh, pills that had iron in it, iron pills, Geritol. <laughs> that's an old thing. And uh, they used to give them those because that's what needs to happen for her to get her natural strength. And here I am, led by the Spirit, to tell her what a doctor would have told her because God was leading. I would say, Lord, lead me. That's what disciples do. And that's what mentors do, and that's what mentors become, those that are led by the Spirit. Number six, 1 Thessalonians 3.10. They gave life-changing counsel in practice. They give life-giving, uh, life I'm sorry, life-changing counsel in practical form. They give life-changing uh, counsel, life-changing counsel in a practical form. That's, again, that story I just told you, 1 Thessalonians 3.10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Uh, that that life-changing counsel means that I'm praying for you. And somebody said to me Sunday that <laughs> when the elders said, wow, that was quite a service. We had counseling. Uh, we had deliverance. We had uh, 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 prophecy. Uh, we, we had teach, we had everything. It was all in a package. And how do you know that when you're a mentor, and I'm talking about one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not talking about just in a group setting, I'm not one-on-one, -on -one. you're able, by all the gifts of God, you're able to operate to help people out of and into, out of their problem and into their success. I would say, Lord, thank you. There should not be another day that you don't have the counsel to give to somebody. If you'll walk in the spirit and you'll pray in the anointing, God will give you the word. It says, do not fret to what you might say when you stand before kings and magistrates, that you in that season, in that moment, I will give you what to say. God will tell you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. God will give you of the hope that lies within you. Counsel is not... Uh, relegated to just counselors, uh, you have what Isaiah says, he is the mighty counselor. He's Jesus. He's in you, the counselor of heaven. What more do you need? He can tell you how it all got put together. He can tell you if, if you know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Come on, saints. Amen. Now, number seven, Proverbs, Proverbs 12, 18. There are experts in the ministry of encouragement. They are experts in the ministry of encouragement. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It says the tongue of the wise is health. The tongue of the wise in Proverbs 12, 18. The tongue of the wise is health. And so we need to realize that we have the ability to really, really give people encouragement. Now, I mean, you know, we have in this church an exhorter's ministry. I'm not often sure if it's going on like it should. When I first uh, received a, a word from the Lord coming out of Seattle, flying in the airplane, I was going across the Grand Canyon. I could see it down there, and I was flying along, and uh, I was going back to, coming back here to Baltimore. I had been in a conference and had dedicated Wendell Smith's new church there at that time, and David Schock was there, and Ch uh, uh, Mel Davis was there, and uh, Joseph Garlington was there, and all these great leaders, Frank Damasio was there, and I was the, one of the speakers, and I was the one asked to dedicate this whole thing. So I'm there with all these great men of God. Uh, and, and, and I heard something from Wendell. He said they had a ministry that they had started in this new church of his uh, called the Exhorter's Ministry. And I heard it, but I didn't hear it till I got on the plane and the Holy Spirit brought back to my remembrance that word. And when I reheard it again in the plane, I wrote it down. I looked it up in the scripture and I thought, wow, it says exhort on another while it is still day for the day of days are evil. How many of you know that we have a ministry 
of exhortation, of encouragement. And we should be using that in this church on a regular basis. Amen. How many of you know I spend a whole lot of time preaching, preaching, preaching. And what do I do? I tell you that you're going to be great. I tell you that you can overcome. I tell you that you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. I tell you that you can speak in tongues. You can be, you know, a healer. You can be anointed to sing. You, oh, man, I'm doing it. I'm encouraging. I'm encouraging. I'm telling you you can't live in sin. Hallelujah. I'm encouraging you to get out of hell so you can get in God. Amen. We need to be encouragers. How many of you right now turn to somebody and encourage them? If there's somebody close enough to you, just turn to them. Tell them something right now that hasn't. That's right. Just turn. Just say, I encourage you. I, I want to tell you I like you. You're going to make. That's why I say I like you. Come on. Come on. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. There you go. How do you know? God wants you to be an encourager. See, I just encourage you to encourage somebody. Now, look at uh, number eight. They help the disciple or their disciples get go set goals that will challenge them. Uh, man, oh man, again, I wish we had the time. I'd like to show you the power of setting goals. You set goals in life. You set goals. Uh, goals uh, are really important. You set short goals and you sh uh, set uh, long goals, okay? You set short ones and you set long goals. Two kinds there. And goals are important because if you don't have a, how many of you like sports? Anybody like sports? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you know there has to be a goal? If you play soccer, Amer uh, American soccer, uh, football is known in Europe. If you play that game and as much as they run, yeah. can you imagine if there was no goal? Them fools would kill themselves. They'd be running down the street for miles until they just died. <laughs> how many know football? You got to have a, a goal. You got to have some place for the football to go through and to go to. Uh, you got to have home base. How do you know if there wasn't a home plate, them fools would still be at the World Series running around that thing trying to find out where's the stopping point. <laughs> I mean, you know, goals are so important. Goals tell you how far to go, and goals always project you to go further. Amen. See, I like to set goals for people where it's just out of their reach, not out of their sight. Amen. Say it again. It's out of their reach, but not out of their sight. And you need to learn to set goals for your children. Set goals they can't obtain. Oh, that's cruel. I want my kids to be able to do and they be successful. Yeah, and you give them goals that, that are so simple and so remedied, remedial that you're causing them to, to be st uh, stumped. You're stumping their growth. You want them to grow? Don't mark where their head is. Mark where that line on the wall is. You know, when kids come and they stand there and mommy and daddy, you know, make that mark on their head, you know. Don't mark it where their head is. Mark it where you want them to go. My, one of my grandsons, his mom's side of the family are all short people. They're all in the five foot range, five foot, five one, four eight, four ten. <laughs> They're little things, and uh, you know this boy's a, a a boy, and he looked at them and said, "Oh my God!" We used to tease him. I used to tell him I was going to take him and hang him in the closet up by his heels at night so he could sleep like a bat, and that maybe in the morning he'd be taller. He just dripped till he got taller, and uh, you know it was a frustration to him. He just all of his now and, and then I got a daughter who has children she has three boys and all of them are six foot one and above mm -hmm. six foot one and up. one's going to be probably six five he's just still growing and 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 these kids are tall and then they get around to this grandson and you know, he's a <laughs> oh lord and uh, boy a miracle has happened he's actually growing he's growing up and we're thrilled <laughs> and and we're just watching him now he's taller than his sister and uh you know i used to hear his dad one day you're going to be tall son don't worry don't listen to them you're going to get tall his dad kept encouraging him encouraging him and and i don't know if that really helped him grow but i bet you it made him stand up a little higher how many of you know that if i walk around like this 
I'm probably a few inches shorter. But how many of you know if I put my shoulders back and stick my chest out and stand up, how many of you know my head just went up? How many of you know God's the glory and the lifter of your head? If you want to get taller, pick your head up. And so we encourage you, and that's what mentors do, and we set goals for you to be taller, to be greater than you are today. I set goals every day in my life that I want to do better than I did the day before. Amen. Let's go on. Are you still with me? Yeah. As a father, number nine, as a father in the faith, they will render financial assistance when warranted by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, however, a heavenly father des uh, desires to bring prospective leaders to a higher level of faith. Now, this whole thing of money here, and it's important now uh, it, that, we, that we look at it, but it's important to understand there's assistance that comes. When I'm a mentor, I'm going to mentor you in finances. But here's how I'm going to mentor you, like it said there, about how a father treats it. Uh, I do not recommend that Christian people in the same church get involved in financial arrangements with each other. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It can really cause offenses to come. And it can cause problems. I've said that since I've been here all the years I've been here. And, uh, but there are things you can do to help somebody. If you're mentoring somebody, I tell my own children, I tell them, don't you ever want the money I have. I'll make sure I give it to some cause that you ain't even ever heard of. You'll never see a penny of it when I die. Don't ever want the money I have, but want how I got what I got. That's the key. That's how you mentor somebody in the area of finances is you teach them how to make money, how to use money, how to save money, how to invest money. Don't teach them to get your money Amen. by handing it to them. That's just welfare. Yeah. Have you hear that? That's welfare. Jesus taught us a couple of parables in the uh, Gospels where the man came and he gave a man a certain amount of talent, gave him a certain amount of money, and all these guys, each one of them took it, they did something with it. One guy buried it. The other guys invested it. How many of you know uh, that's a smart uh, discipler who takes and gives you something to invest in something to get more than you had when you first got it? How many of you know that's the kingdom? The kingdom of God is that if God gives me something to give you, I want you to take what you get and invest it into some others so that you get more back for your return. I get more back for my return. How do you hear that? Now, that's important, and apply it to finances. Um, number 10, they expose their training to a new orbit of ministry books. Oh, boy. Uh, literature uh, that contain insights. Uh, uh, that may be foreign but beneficial to them. I'm going to say it again. You need to understand that if you're a mentor, uh, you need to expose uh, those around you to uh, an orbit of new uh, ministry, books, literature, uh, etc., that will take you maybe into some foreign areas that you're not aware of, but will be beneficial to you down the road. I say all the time, Read, read, read. I was just talking with Wayman this week, and I said to Wayman, I said, Wayman, here's the last thing. We had a long conversation. It was good. And uh, I said, Wayman, here's what I want to say. And I listed some books I wanted him to read. I said, Wayman, read, son. Read, man. Read, read, study. And I gave him an illustration. I said, uh, the word becomes the frame that you build around you for everything you learn from the word. I'll say it like this. The word becomes a frame. You see this tent, these walls, they're like a frame. And everything good that goes on goes on inside the frame. So I said, uh, you want to learn prayer? Build a framework around your life of prayer. Build a strong framework of prayer understanding. One of the best books on prayer that I could tell you to read is uh, by Miles Monroe. Miles Monroe, book on, his book on prayer is just one of the best you'll ever, ever read. 
And uh, I hope we get those in the bookstore. If we don't have them, I hope they get in the bookstore. And, uh, but learn that you build a framework. If you're trying to be a person that knows how to pray, you better build a framework. How many of you know there's divides and all inside of the framework of the walls of this building? If I just built the walls and didn't build the framework around it, all the walls would fall down and be open to the elements. So you have to build, if you want to learn about the kingdom of God, build a framework around. If you want to learn about tithing, build a framework about giving. If you want to learn principles of God, build a framework around it through the word of God. Build around your life the framework so that you can build all the insides to it that you want. I mean, you know, this big building has no columns in it. And that's awesome because we can build anything we want in here because we have a solid framework around this sanctuary that lets us do anything we want to do inside of this space. Now that's important. Number 11, and this is important now in the commitment to your discipleship and your being discipled, being in the timing of God, they co-minister with emergency, uh, emerging leaders to allow trainers, uh, trainees to share the honor and stability of a well-known ministry, okay? In the timing of God, there's an exposure. <coughs> and a co-minister with emerging leaders to allow the trainees to share in the honor and stability of other well-known ministry. That's important, okay? What that means is this, is that I go places and I take people with me. I've taken Antonio. I was telling somebody the other day, uh, Bishop Aaron Claxton, the great man of God, he passed away last Sunday. And uh, his son and I were talking uh, about him, his dad, and what an honor it was to have known him and what an influence his dad had on all of our lives. And, uh, but I was saying some things to him. I, uh, the boy was being stoic and he was you know, strong and he was standing in the faith. And I said these words, I said to him, uh, to the son, I said, let me say something to you. You must grieve like a son and not like a bishop. Mm. Oh my God, he started crying. Mm. And it just broke his heart. Mm. And I said, grieve like a father has been lost, not like a bishop has been lost. Mm. And boy, does that make a lot of difference. Mm. And so I, as I was talking to him, I reminded myself and I reminded the son, I said, you know, I remember I took your dad to China and I took him to Japan. Uh, his father had always in ministry uh, wanted to go to Japan and he wanted to go to uh, China. And I had invitation to go there and preach. So I took this local pastor in my city. I gave him an invitation to come with me and I was going to take him so he could preach and be with me. That was the best trip. He had the best time. I remember, though, when we went into Japan, I got a little ticked off at the airport. We were at this lounge waiting to get the plane, and some of the Chinese people uh, waited on me, waited on the other people I had with me, but they bypassed him because <laughs> of his color. And I, you know, I guess they thought he was my, my boy or something. I went, stupid thing. And I grabbed this kid walking by with this tray. I grabbed him right by his coat. Whoop! I pulled his little tail up there. I said, come here. I said, you better not give another drink to anybody in this lounge till you give this man what he wants. Do you understand me? Oh, oh, yes, oh, oh I understand. <laughs> I said, and do it now. He, whoop! Back, he came back. Oh, yeah, Coca-Cola. Oh, you Coca-Cola. And whatever he wanted from that time on, he got it. And we had the best time laughing at that. And he preached in China. And uh, we had smuggled Bibles. He even got to smuggle Bibles. Uh, but he failed. <laughs> because when we got to the, to the checkout, and, you know, going through the customs, and the door was there into China, he had this backpack with 120 Bibles in it, and he saw Don Mark, one of our guys, get arrested with Bibles, and he panicked, and he dropped it on the floor, kicked it up against the counter there, and he walked out with his suitcase, and I, I saw him walking, I thought, well, you chicken, and I picked it up, and, and long story, I took his and mine both, 
Boy, he heard about it later. But we laughed and laughed. We had such a good time. I remember one time Frank Reed talked to me about wanting to, you know, find out what's going on in revival and how he wanted to be a part of a move of God. So I said, okay, come with me. I'm taking you to Argentina. So I take the great Dr. Frank Reed <laughs> down to Argentina. What happens? He gets hands laid on him. And he gets spun in a circle and ends up on the floor. And I said, oh, my God. I got the famous Dr. Reed laying on the floor. What in the world have I done now? And uh, we got in front of some people that were so Carlos Anacondia. Woo, man, I mean, we were with some great preachers. And uh, Claudia Frazon and these guys, these are great anointed preachers that God was using at that time in a revival all over Argentina. Man, I tell you what, I took uh, Bishop, uh, uh, Bishop uh, Johnson, Clifford Johnson. Can you believe this? Here's a brother. Ain't never been to Africa. So I said, let's fix that. Why don't you go with me to, to Nigeria? I was going to Nigeria probably four times a year at that point. I said, why don't you go with me? Let's go. I'm going to take you to Nigeria. You want to see what, what something looks like? Let me take you there. I, I could take you to another couple of countries, but let me take you to Nigeria. You will see something you ain't ever seen before. We went, my God, can can make a difference, got started there in Nigeria and Lagos, and they started feeding 50 to 52,000 people a month, and he got to be a part of that. We had pictures in there in the office of, with us standing together praying with these people. It was awesome. I don't know if you know that part of mentoring is to expose others to opportunities that they might not get if they hadn't been exposed. And why did God expose me to the nations of the world if I don't take others and show them also? Amen. Come on, let me hear that. Amen. I go to Madagascar. Well, lo and behold, uh, I take, uh, you know, uh, the great uh, man of God, uh, Antonio, wants to go. He's a great preacher. I want to go to overseas the mission so i take him to madagascar i mean you know all of a sudden these doors open up and we take him into ghana we take these people took brother mel into ghana he helped build a building he ain't never been overseas he ain't been in, been out of dundalk yeah, if he went to dundalk that was like going on a vacation no I'm just teasing and uh but here, here's this thing all of a sudden we're exposing people to other levels yeah. and we say lord expose me to a new level in you Expose me to some new things. God wants you. Now look, there's a lot of people that will take you and run you around. And they'll expose you to ungodly things. They'll expose you to things that are based on rebellion. Let's go follow this new ministry. Let's go follow this new thing. And they'll take you out to some concert or some guy that's floating through town. Listen to me. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is somebody that has been approved, somebody that's seasoned, somebody that I know. Because if I know them, I'm approving them to you. It's like children. If I know that you're going to do well there, I'm going to send you there. If I don't know where you're going, I ain't sending you. Hello. Number 12. Mentors are prime catalysts in the leadership development. Mentors are the prime catalyst that God wants for the ministry development. Catalyst. You know what a catalyst is? Catalyst is the element like two parts of something, a resin and, a, and, a, and a, another element that you mix together and becomes like a hardener and it causes that substance to be reality. So when you are a catalyst, you are that, that agent that helps something. You're adding your something to their something to make the something better than the something would have been with it just one part of it. How many of you hear that? I mean, you know, you buy products a lot of times and it says it comes in two parts. You have to mix this with this. If you mix the two together, it becomes. If you don't mix the two together, you only get one part. And when you only get one part, it's not functional. It's not functional. Are you hearing me? I got a couple more. You ready? We got a little more time. You still there? I mean, you still there? Okay. Now, number 13, 
Through relating with a mentor, the trainee can learn valuable lessons that took the mentor many years and much pain to learn. To learn. Oh, wow. I, have, I remember Joseph Garlington saying one time, the best lesson to learn is the lesson that someone else has learned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the key. And, and, and look, when I talk with people, work with people, most of what I say on a regular basis to people is I'm, a, I'm offering them experiences. I'm saying, I, I've been there, I did that, I, I got the t-shirt, I got a bunch of them. I, I know what that, don't, don't do that, don't, I've been, I, tr I tried that, don't do that. Are you listening to me? And that's what a good mentor does. A good mentor, a good discipler, uh, is one that helps people learn through the lessons, the valuable lessons that they have, have experienced. And so that's why you want somebody. That's why you want to be around somebody. That's why you sit here and you get the benefit of all my stories. How many of you have heard my stories? And there are lots of them. How do you know? You're benefiting. You're benefiting from those stories because I tell you, what the story did, how the story happened, what opened the door for the story, what caused me the pain in the story, or what caused me success in the story. The story helps me help you to experience new levels in your life and to avoid new devils. Have you say, Lord, I need a new level, not a new devil. Amen. Come on, say it. I need a new level, not a new devil. I mean, you know, if you get somebody that can take you to a new level, you'll avoid a lot of devils. <laughs> Verse 14, sometimes mentors are referred to as coaches. Darlene does that. Uh, she's been known as a coach in some of the fields that she's worked at. And uh, the fellow that was in here, Bonnie and his, uh, uh, his, her husband, uh, that did the marriage conference, uh, th that he's the confident coach, yeah. right? And uh, some of you bought some of his material. Read it. If you bought it, read it. Don't put it on a shelf. It is not jumping off the book into your heart. Please. Sometimes mentors are referred to as coaches because they compel their players, their trainees, to do what they want them to do so they can achieve their goals. Coaches have a little bit of an assertive attitude about getting you to perform at levels you don't believe you can. And we hear that. That's what a good coach does. A good coach coaches you to perform at a better level, whether it's uh, a coach of economics, a coach of football, a coach of anything. They're trying to get you to rise up to the level of your potential. Your potential is that which you've yet to do. To rise up to your potential and accomplish something great for the glory of God. And that's what a good coach does. And uh, I, uh, I, I enjoy... The years in my past, when I look at the men who were coaches in my life, and they helped me, both physical, uh, natural coaches, uh, athletics and stuff, people that coached me in that area. I remember those people. I had a wrestling coach. He used to date his daughter. That ended my wrestling career. But <laughs> no, but anyway, I did. I had a wrestling coach and that was an awesome coach, one of the best in, the, in our whole region. And he taught me. Uh, he was my coach, and he taught me how to wrestle. And when I was in junior high, it was really, really good. And then I went up into high school, and I could really do well because I was coached properly. I played football into high school, and I learned, and I had a good coach until I finally quit high school uh, and went, well, that school, and went down to Florida and finished school surfing. And uh, uh, I, I, I felt like I knew everything. <laughs> And uh, put that at the mark and say, downfall. That's where he fell down. Yeah, right, you too. And uh, so anyway, you need to know that uh, coaches are those that compel others uh, uh, to do what they know they can, can do, reach their potential. Number 15, most mentors believe that the most important things are caught in a relationship uh, setting rather than taught. Caught rather than taught. That's a key now. I am very geared that way. Yeah. I learn that way. I learn better being taught than I do, uh, I mean, being caught than I do being taught. 
When I sit with somebody and they're trying to grind it into my brain, my brain can't hold it, its attention to that. I, if you take something apart and do it in front of me, I can do it. My wife will tell you, if you take me somewhere, I can find my way back. I automatically got it figured out. I know. I go to a hotel. I know right my where I'm going. Once I go the right way, go in the room one time, come out, I know where I'm going. I learn by what I uh, it, it catch rather than, you know, the things that I'm taught. And, and, and so that's why that scripture on Sunday was so important that when we learn Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, especially verse 2, it says that we might mature. Verse 1 says that we might mature or that we might go on to perfection, laying not again the foundations, uh, the original foundations of the laying on of hands and all the dead works and all that stuff. And the thing is, that word perfection there had an interesting Greek definition. It means learning and, and practicing. Learning but practicing. And the key was that the Greek way it's written says you must learn but must practice what you've learned. And boy, is that important. How many people today, we live in this electronic world that we're taught so much and we're not learning anything because we're not getting it. We're not catching it. And I just asked you to begin to say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, teach me how to catch. Teach me how to catch what you want me to uh, possess, what you want me to obtain. Lord, let me be in church and let me catch it. Let me grab a hold of it and get it where I can really hold on to it. we got a few more minutes. Let's go a little bit further. Uh, and verse 16, since mentors are specialists in relationships, their protégés advance primarily through the assimilation of truth and life exemplified in the mentor through the medium of soul bonding relationship over a period of time. Now, mentors are specialists in relationships. And so we, we advance in the process of our mentoring or making disciples by this key word. Now, it's so important that we've landed here. I got one more, and then we've landed here. Is This is the reason, saints, that we must learn in all the electronic world we have today, everything that we have electronic, how little relationships we really develop. And that's a sad indictment to the church. And I'm saying and declaring to you that Rock Church, Rock City Church, was not designed in its beginning to be people who did not have relationship, but it was people who definitely had relationship. Mm -hmm. And I want to say to you, Rock City Church, the next 35-year generation, may God open the eyes of your understanding that you would begin to desire to know the person around you, mm -hmm. to see what it means to have fellowship to have bread breaking time together, to visit one another, to laugh with one another, to do things. Learn how important relationships are. Amen. I have good relationships with a lot of different people. And uh, some of them I go to dinner with, some of them I uh, go places, I go fishing with, some of them. And, and relationships by individuals differ from individuals. So sometimes I have relationships with people that uh, are my fishing buddies and I don't go with them shopping. And then I have somebody else that maybe is a, a relationship that loves fast cars and, 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 and unique looking cars and, and old cars. And so there are people that I can fellowship like that and it's a different kind of fellowship. How I many of you know, you can't make everybody the fellowship for every occasion. Amen. Amen. Now you hear that. Uh, now, if you want to fellowship with me at the mall, you're going to have the most boring time in your life. Because when I go to a mall, I already know what I'm going to get. Sometimes I even know if they got it, because I check. And when I go... I'm going like a, like a man possessed. I'm going in. 
I'm going to buy that pair of shoes. I know I want brown ones. I know I saw it already. I saw it in the magazine. I know what I want. I'm going in. I'm going to buy them. I sit down, take my shoes off, put the thing on. It fits. I'm out of here. Here's my money. Boom. I'm gone. Chop. I'm not going to go. Pair number 62. Let me look at them. Well, let me see the, the kind of brown, the sort of brown, the, the in-between brown. No, sorry. That's that's my wife. You ain't going shopping with me like that. If I go shopping, because I don't like shopping, especially this time of year. Lord Jesus. You know, I have a problem with demons. I have a problem with people that hang out with demons and people that, that manifest. You go shopping this time of year, you will see more women manifesting. <laughs> Come on. And the point being is, you, you got to learn, hang out, fellowship with people of like mind and of like purpose for that kind of fellowship. When I want to hang out with, with certain people that are into construction, I have friends that have built everything you ever built and never imagined building. I like hanging out with them. When I need to talk about that, that's where I'm going to hang out. When I want to hang out with preachers or when I want to hang out with men that have been in this gospel, I sat during the convention I was at in Texas, I sat with Charles Green and Charles Simpson, two of the great, great, great fathers of the Pentecostal charismatic movement of our time. I had personal uh, private dinners and lunches with those two men so I could drink and I could eat and I could live through the process of their stories and really went away having good fellowship. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Some of you fellowship with people because you fellowship out of misery. You fellowship out of pain. Or you fellowship out of uh, your frustrations. Or you fellowship out of your murmurings. You like to be around people that are like you. Well, don't hang out with people that are like you. Fellowship with people that are better than you. <laughs> In fact, just fellowship with somebody that's smarter than you. Jesus. So, I, don't, I don't know if I could find that. Well, I, I know you could. Because you already said how dumb you are by saying you can't find somebody that smart anyway. But uh, you've you got to learn what fellowship really is all about. Amen. Fellowship is not just finding somebody to whine with. It's not about that. It's about coming and gaining what someone has and leaving what you have with that someone. I fished up here for a couple of years, and I got frustrated because I was used to fishing in the Atlantic Ocean, fished since I was a little boy, six years old. I caught my first fish, and I learned to fish with the best. I fished with guys. We would go out marlin fishing, and we caught uh, seven marlins at one day, one fishing trip. I not long ago caught seven white marlins. No, I'm sorry, nine white marlins on one trip. And I caught a sailfish on top of it. Marlin and a sailfish. And uh, listen, I, I've been, I, oh my God. I come up here and this Chesapeake Bay up here, there's old murky water. I'm thinking, Lord, what am I doing? I can't catch no fish. God, I know I can fish. I know I can well, a man came up here. I was praying now. I'm asking the Lord, give me a new friend, you asked my wife. I said, Lord, give me a new friend that knows how to fish. <laughs> and lo and behold, a man came to the office. Tammy, Tammy, she can tell the story now. Came to the office. He said, is the pastor here, Pastor Pierce? And she said, well, um, no, he's not here right now. Oh, I wanted to see him. There's something I want to ask him about. She got talking to him, and he wanted to help with our girls' home. He had a thing that he did where he would send their girls to get tattoos removed off of their bodies. You know, when they got 
Bill on there, and now they're married to Joe. You know, they wanted Bill gone, so they did all kinds of stuff. And and so he got talking, she got talking, and says, "Oh yeah, I, I, I got to get going because Saturday I got to go get ready. I'm going fishing in the morning." Oh, well, my pastor Tammy said loves to fish. He does. Does he know how to fish? She said, "Come on." So she took him down the hall. She opened my door. She didn't let him in. She just opened the door and said, look in the room. I got this big old fish, a, a sailfish on the wall. I got pictures of marlin on there that I caught. He goes, wow, I got to meet your pastor. He said, I ain't never caught a marlin. Ooh, boy. Next thing I know, she says, uh, pastor, a guy came to see you. wants to help the girls get the tattoos removed. I said, well, that's nice. Okay. And uh, I have no fellowship there. I ain't into tattoos. Don't want them removed because I don't have them. So I ain't, you know, no fellowship. Oh, but he saw the fish on your wall and he wants to fellowship with you. I said, come on, give me his number. I called him up. I said, hey, what are you doing, man? He said, hey. And I said, you came to see me? Yeah, I ain't no longer. I said, hey, where are you going fishing? He said, oh, I'm going rock fishing tomorrow. Oh, you are? Yeah. I said, well, you know, you got to take me rock fishing. He said, you want to go? I said, yeah, I want to go. I've been trying to fish. I fished all my life. I caught marlin. I knew he'd like Neil. I caught marlin. I caught tuna. I caught everything. But I can't catch these rockfish up here. He said, come on, I'll take you. So he took me fishing. Now, think about this. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm a retired coach. Think of that. He's a retired coach, and he's going to take me fishing Coach, you understand? He's going to take me fishing. And he did. He taught me to fish with, I had fished with 16 fishing poles at one time across the whole body of water out this way on a big line out on some wood out there called planer boards, a hundred feet that way, a hundred feet that way, and lines running 120, 80 foot, 60 foot, 40 foot, and then deep, two lines deep. Line back 220 feet. I had fishing poles everywhere. I had to go break the bank. And I got all these fishing poles. <laughs> Next thing I know, boom, I'm catching fish that are 38, 42, 48, 50 inch rockfish, big old striped bass. I'm bringing them in, throwing them in my boat and go, yeah, man. Hey, I am learning this thing. So everything he did, I mean every way he held the hook, every way he clipped it, everything he used, I learned, I learned. He didn't see me. I was taking notes. See, I had, a, I had my own tablet right in here. I'm just writing them down, boy. I'm writing them down in my head. I got it. So then I said to my boys, hey, let's go fishing, guys. I'm going to take you kids fishing. Yeah, yeah, Dad. We're going out again, but we ain't ever going to catch. Oh, yeah, come on. Boom, they hooked up. One morning we went out. It, it was at uh, 8 o'clock we started. By 9.30, we already had our limit. We had fish in the boat. They were 40-inch plus fish, and the boys were happy, and I was smart, and I said, thank you, Jesus. You sent me a mentor, and he taught me how to fish in this area. Amen. You understand my point? My point is, is that fellowship is a key ingredient to mentorship. Don't make mentorship this sterile, kind of dried up, dead thing that you're trying to find a way to have fellowship with somebody that you have nothing in common with them. Fellowship is meant to bring you to a new place. You get fellows in a ship, you'll get to the other side of the shore. Come on, let's get this thing right. Let's get into fellowshipping. And Proverbs 4 and verse 1 and 5. And I'm about to close. I'm about ready to shut down. So come on, man. I got some more on this to, to tell you. I, I'm probably going to have to break this out a little bit. This is going to take me a while to get you through this one. And then, oh, Lord, if I do the double portion thing, oh, my God, double portion. Oh, Lord Jesus. Anyway, we'll find enough Thursday nights. I believe there's enough Thursday nights in the next year. I could probably get through this. You know, one time during revival meetings, just before they started, I tried to teach on a Thursday night on a particular subject. <laughs> and it took me exactly three years to teach that subject. I could not get done. I could not get taught. I just, it, the glory of God would show up and mess up the whole thing. Lord, are we going somewhere again? Help me, Jesus. 
I hope so. Can you hear me tonight? Now look at this, Proverbs 4, 1 and 5. Infants, I'm going to read the scripture yet. Infants need nourishment for growth, but adults in the Lord demonstrate their maturity by output patterned after the life of their mentor. I'll say it again. Infants need nourishment for growth. They need food. But adults, you and I, in the Lord, demonstrate the maturity, their maturity, by output patterned after the life of their mentor. Watch. Hear ye children the instructions of a father and attend to know understanding. Attend to know understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. Isn't that awesome that he's saying? I've given you some good doctrine. I've preached good stuff to you. For I, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thy heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. A father is boasting about his relationship uh, with his children and how he had this son. Uh, he said, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me, my father taught me also, and said unto me, Let thy heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. My pastor said, listen to me, Bart, you young drug addict, you young hippie. Listen to me, and I'm going to give you words that will cause you to live this gospel. Live this life of the kingdom. Live as a true disciple. And then you'll become a mentor. And it says, get wisdom, get understanding, and forget it not. Amen. Oh, my God. Get wisdom, get understanding, and forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Oh, Lord Jesus. Get wisdom, Lord. I pray over this group right here. I pray over this church that, God, you'll cause us to move in wisdom that we'll get it. And we'll get understanding. See, wisdom and understanding are not the same. We need wisdom for the knowing of what we don't know. We need understanding of knowing how and what to do with what we now know. I'll say it again. We get wisdom from what we don't know and then we get understanding on from what we don't know that we now know on what to do and when to do what we now know what we should do. I know that sounds like a tongue twister and I don't want to repeat it again, but I got to tell you, get wisdom, you'll get understanding. And then it says, neither decline Oh, it said, forget not now. Don't forget the wisdom and understanding. But it said, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Amen. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Oh, God. Oh, God. Neither, neither, Lord. Neither shall we decline from the words of a father's mouth. Amen. And so I say to you, I have men all over this world, uh, men that call me, their father, the man that uh, is the chief of police calls me his father. He says, I'm his father. And any some of you I am looked at as that. Some of you call me Papa. Some of you call me that I'm your father. Well, listen to me as a father, not just as a father in, in that way, but a father in the faith. Listen to me tonight. This area of discipleship and of mentoring is so vital to our success because as God brings us, all of you, into the full maturity of your faith, the full maturity of your walk with God, as God brings you into that, into that realm and causes what happened on Sunday, all those people up on that stage, if all those people up on that stage stood up and did what God said, saying he wants to be done through their life. We're in for an explosion because when you build the base, which is the leadership, this way, you'll build the church this way. When the base goes this way, the pyramid of the church goes straight up. We're about ready to go forward and grow into a tree, grow into a superstructure that we have never seen and never been before. We're into a new place of God. And in that process, 
then God sends. He's going to send people in. You're going to come to church on a Sunday, and it's going to trinkle in. You're not going to notice it at first. This one's going to start coming, and that one's going to start coming, and then this one's going to start coming. And next thing you know, you're going to look around and say, my, my, my. We can't sit where we used to sit. we got to sit over here. we got to sit back there. And this thing's just going to keep moving and moving and moving. And as God does that, you need to look at this and realize that the greatest thing that you learned in this time that God brought us into a new place in the word and a new place in our purpose was exposing us to teachings like this that would help us learn the value of mentoring somebody. Those of you that work in the audio need to be mentoring. Somebody in the TV need to be mentoring. You need to be mentoring kids in the Sunday school. You need to be mentoring ushers. You need to be mentoring worship leaders and singers and band players. And you need to be ministering and mentoring somebody who's going to get into those areas. And then you need to be mentoring people that are walking through difficulties and mentoring them on how to get out of it, how to stay married, how to, how to, how to become successful in their in in their life as a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple of Christ. You're going to be teaching them on how to invest and how to, how to uh, see increase come. Uh, Scott Dixon uh, uh, teaches in the Bible school. He knows uh, the understanding. He has a great understanding of finances and how to bring finances into your personal life and how to see it grow. He should be mentoring. He should be teaching that. That should be uh, Kristen. She should be teaching uh, all that she knows about uh, the understanding understanding of our history from a governmental position and how the government and the roles of the government and the positions of government work so that we can begin to prepare ourselves because how are we going to take back these fields, uh, these mountains, uh, if we don't begin to learn? Uh, I told uh, Ian recently he wants to be in acting, and I've encouraged him in that. But why should he go and just go out and learn something and then take it out to the secular world? Go learn it and bring it back in here so that all of our productions get better and better and better. Saints of God, it's time. We're on the move to grow, to expand, uh, to think different, to uh, act different, uh, and stop laying the old foundations uh, of yesterday and trying to do it by works uh, and rise up and say we're new creatures in Christ. Stand on your feet. Put your hands up as high as you can. Act like you're trying to reach into heaven and begin to say, Lord, thank you. Come on, thank you. Come on, get up on your feet. Come on, get up on your feet. Put your hands up. Wave them to the Lord. Say, thank you, Lord. It's a new day. It's a new day at Rock City Church. And we are going to rise up and become all that you intend for us to be. We're going to apprehend the thing we've been apprehended for. We're going to take hold of the new ones coming in and we're going to train them up. We're not going to let people that are possessed by devils and witches to train up and divide our church and divide our children and send our, our best potential young leaders out of the church uh, through deception. We're going to step in there, make up the gap, proceed, uh, and begin to change uh, our church. Come on, give the Lord praise. Come on, put your hands together. God bless you.